Welcome to this IFRS Foundation podcast, which will focus on the April meeting of the International Accounting Standards Board. That meeting took place in London from 9 to 11 April 2019. My name is Matt Tilling. I'm a member of the technical staff here at the ISB. Today I'm joined by the chair of the board, Hans Hugewurst, and vice chair Sue Lloyd to talk through the latest meeting and other developments. Hans, before we talk about the board meeting this month, you spoke about sustainability reporting at a conference organized by the University of Cambridge. Yes, the title of my speech was what sustainability reporting can and what it cannot do. In terms of what it can do, I uh, made clear that I think that sustainability reporting can be important to investors if sustainability issues can affect the future financial performance of a uh, of a company for example the insurance business it's clear that climate change issues already affect their earnings and will do more so in in the future if you're a car manufacturer also the strengthening of environmental standards uh, will also speed up the transition to electrical cars uh, so here sustainability uh, issues are also very important. Uh, and that is also th- one of the reasons why we are uh, updating our management commentary pra- practice statement, basically a guide how to uh, write the front end of your annual report. Uh, companies um, uh, will uh, need to talk about sustainability issues if they uh, think that is going to affect their future earnings. At the same time, I have made clear that we should not have exaggerated expectations of sustainability reporting as a catalyst uh, for change. And I've given the uh, example of uh, the the aviation industry. Clearly, we don't need any sustainability reporting to know that that it has a huge impact on uh, the environment, uh, one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse uh, gases. gases. And at the same time, we see that the aviation industry is exempt from all taxes. Uh, They're exempt from fuel tax, they are exempt from VAT, they are exempt from carbon pricing uh, initiatives, uh, for example, in in Europe. So all the sustainability reports in the world are not going to change that. What we need here, if we want to reach an effect in terms of less pollution, are public policy uh, initiatives, such as the introduction, for example, of a kerosene tax. So don't expect too much of a sustainability reporting. And what I've also made clear is that it is very confusing uh, for companies that there are so many standards and so many um, initiatives in terms of sustainability reporting. It's very urgent that there will be some consolidation in that, uh, in that field. And, and that is also um, a message I'm going to give to standard setters that come together in what we call the corporate reporting dialogue where several uh, standard setters, uh, such as the IRC uh, and uh, the American SESB uh, and the ISB all sit together to see how they can cooperate more closely. Anyway, uh, I said a lot more in that speech. People who are interested in the details can find it on our website. So this month we also hosted a meeting of the Transition Resource Group for the Insurance Contract Standard, IFRS 17. That's right. So in April, we held another TRG meeting uh, where we considered 46 new submissions. There was a detailed discussion of the identification of investment components for people who are interested in that topic. As always, I think it was a a useful discussion. The TRG has been very helpful, I think, for those working on implementing IFRS 17. But one thing we did note in the meeting was that we saw a continuation of the trend that we discussed at the September TRG meeting where... At this point, many of the submissions that we're getting are covering really mechanical or narrow aspects of IFRS 17 and focusing really on pretty specific fact patterns. And we take sort of two messages from that. First positive message, I think, is that um, we think it shows that companies are moving further into their implementation process, so they're getting into the detail, which is very positive. And I guess another positive message is that it probably means that from our perspective, the TRGs reached a level of maturity in its role. Sort of the the main purpose for it is probably passed. So at this point, we don't have any uh, further meetings of the group that are actually scheduled. And that is linked quite nicely to the first big topic discussed during this month's board meeting, possible amendments to IFRS 17. So would you like to take us through those? 
I'm not going to go through the detail of the amendments, but we're sort of at the final stages of discussing what will be proposed in the exposure draft. And what we did at the April meeting was to sort of look back at the suite of proposed amendments that the boards um, looked at over the last few months, considered that as a whole, um, evaluated each of the proposed amendments against the criteria for making amendments that the board agreed back in October, and considered the likely effects of those proposed amendments to 17. So having done all of that, taken a holistic look, the board confirmed that it does wish to proceed to publish an exposure draft setting out these proposed amendments. Um, and also the board looking at the scope of what we're proposing to focus on in the exposure draft reconfirmed its tentative decision from November about the mandatory effective date of 17 and the, um, the period of the temporary exemption uh, from applying IFRS 9 that's been provided to insurance companies and confirmed that we'll propose in the exposure draft a one-year deferral to 2022 for both of those things. Hans, an intense debate during the board meeting was followed by some important clarifications in the primary <coughs> financial statements project, specifically about management performance measures. Yes, um, well, the primary financial statement project is all about providing more structure and more transparency and discipline to uh, the financial statements, especially the income statement. And this month, uh, we made tentative decisions to further enhance the transparency and discipline of what we call management performance measures. Management performance measures are essentially non-GAAP measures, uh, which are widely used by companies such as, for example, adjusted operating profit. We do not want to root these non-GAAP measures out. They will always be there and they can even be useful. Uh, but we want to provide more transparency and more discipline around these non-GAAP measures. So what are we going to do? First of all, these management performance measures need to be uh, centrally located in a note in the financial statements so that investors know exactly where to find them, that they don't have to go all over the place. Secondly, they need to be reconciled to the nearest subtotal uh, that is defined by IFRS. Uh, and since we have now uh, already decided to uh, define two more subtotals, uh, that will be easier uh, to do and more transparent. When we put them in the notes, uh, they will also be subject to audit. That will also improve uh, discipline uh, around these non-GAAP uh, measures. And finally, uh, the board felt it was important to clarify that management performance measures will be subject to the general requirement from IAS 1 uh, that uh, information included in financial statements must provide a faithful representation of an entity's uh, performance. We also decided that a company may only identify a measure uh, as a management performance measure in its financial statement if it uses the same measure in its other public communications with users, for example, in press releases. And we think this uh, requirement is important to reinforce the objective of management performance measures, which is that they are measures that communicate performance to investors in management's view. If a measure is not used by management in its investor communication, then clearly it cannot be classified as a management performance measure. So the board has been thinking more about business combinations under common control, <coughs> BC, UC, Cs. Yes, so continuing our research in this area. And to help us in our thinking, we've asked the staff to think about whether and how transactions in the scope of the project can be differentiated from business combinations that aren't under common control. We've also asked the staff to look at the information that would be useful to the various primary users of the receiving company's financial statements, and the receiving company is basically the company making the acquisition. Um, also to look at whether the benefits of providing particular information justify the costs of providing the information, and to consider complexity and structuring risks. One important uh, sort of source of direction that the board agreed on this month to give the staff direction for their thinking was to agree that the board need not pursue a single measurement approach for all transactions within the scope of the project. So for example, the board could pursue a current value-based approach for all or some transactions if they affect a non-controlling interest, and a different approach, such as a predecessor approach, if there was no non-controlling interest but there were 
um, third party lenders and creditors in the receiving entity. Now you might have noticed I was careful with my choice of words there, I said need not pursue, so we didn't decide not to pursue a single approach, but that we're open to considering this sort of mixed approach. Hans, the board continues to grapple with the topic of goodwill and impairment. One of the issues you looked at this month was potential additional disclosures in this area. Yes, uh, one objective of the goodwill and impairment project is to identify better disclosures for business combinations. The board discussed potential improvements uh, to the disclosure objectives and disclosure requirements of IFRS 3. For example, uh, we will clarify uh, the IFRS 3 disclosure objectives and add a new disclosure objectives for entities to provide information on the subsequent performance of the acquired business. We will add requirements for entities to disclose whether the key objectives of the business combinations have been achieved. Sue, what's new on dynamic risk management? Okay, so at this um, month's meeting we focused on a couple of things. One was whether there's particular types of strategies that we don't think would be appropriate, for want of a better word, um, to um, be in place when the, the DRM model is applied. And secondly, we looked at some aspects of presentation and disclosure. Um, If people are interested in disclosures, it's probably good to look at the detail and update, but just focusing on the types of strategies for a moment. So the board decided that the DRM model shouldn't permit negative balances to be designated within a target profile. The board also um, agreed that in order to qualify to apply the model, changes to a company's risk management strategy and the target profile should be infrequent. And also the board agreed that the company's risk management strategy, which is the basis for the application of the DRM model, should be clearly documented and that the time horizon of the target profile should be specified and documented in a way that it's not a contingent uh, profile. Um, So that's all pretty techy, geeky stuff. Um, Those that have a real passion to read this are best, I think, to look at the board papers or update. Sue, are there any implementation matters that you would like to discuss with us from this month's board meeting? Well, the board got an update from the staff on the work of the Interpretations Committee at the January and March meetings of that committee. So I don't want to really talk about any of the implementation matters specifically, but one thing I will just touch on quickly is maintenance. So one uh, discussion that we had at the board table this month was um, an update from the staff on the work that they're doing on IAS 8. In particular, the way forward, re-deliberating the proposals we put out a few years ago now on the definition of accounting policies and accounting estimates in IES 8. The staff are proposing that we move forward focusing on the accounting estimates definition in IES 8 and not really um, changing the accounting policies definition. And they were really looking for confirmation from the board that we're comfortable with that sort of direction of thinking. Which, which we gave them some feedback on. So we'll, we'll see this coming back with a request for decisions at a future board meeting. Hans, the board received an update on the research program? Yes, uh, I think the main thing to note here is that uh, staff expect to start work shortly on the post-implementation review of IFRS 10, uh, Consolidated Financial Statements, IFRS 11, Joint Arrangements, and IFRS 12, Disclosure of Interests in Other Entities. Uh, So we will definitely be talking more about these issues over the coming months. I think it's also worth noting that the board agreed to start the drafting process and and that starts with what we call a a balloting process for the exposure draft of proposed amendments to IAS 1, Presentation of Financial Statements, and IFRS Practice Statement 2, Making Materiality Judgments. Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, The balloting is the formal process by which ISB members uh, agree to the publication of an exposure uh, draft. This all takes place after all the decisions have been taken over the month uh, in the board meetings. Uh, When a document is in the process of being balloted by the uh, board members, um, they uh, review it to confirm that the drafting is consistent with their technical decisions that they took uh, earlier. Um, so a, uh, a, a, a ballot draft may go through a number of drafts and technical matters may arise that sometimes need to be brought back to the board for discussion during the board me- meeting. doesn't happen very often. 
And then once uh, uh, the draft is finalized, there is a formal vote to confirm that the board is happy to release the document. Uh, for an exposure draft, at least nine board members out of the total of 14 must agree to its publication. And that's not a vote at the board table, that's rather, you know, balloting, signing a document, signing in blood behind the scenes that we're happy for it to be published. So basically in IS1, quite a simple proposal, simple but we think is important, to say specifically that accounting policies should be disclosed when they're material to the financial statements, and then sort of hand in hand with that, um, proposing adding a few examples to the materiality practice statement to illustrate when accounting policies might be material to try and reduce the sort of clutter that some people see with accounting policies. So trying to emphasise when they matter enough to be disclosed and also to encourage people to make sure that the disclosures they provide are entity specific, not just repeating the requirements and the standards. Thanks for that summary, Sue. Well, thank you, Hans and Sue, and thank you to our listeners. Any feedback on these podcasts, please email communications at ifrs.org. The full summary of the board's discussion and decisions at the April meeting can be found in the ISB update on the IFRS Foundation's website. You can also subscribe to receive new episodes as they become available on iTunes. We look forward to talking with you all again very soon.